Before we are joined by our very special guest today, we are joined today by our former co-co-host, Coach K. And so we uh, have a little pregame banter for you before we get started right here in the Sports Deli. Remember, the Sports Daily is sponsored by SportRx. You can find them online at sportrx.com. They are the leader in sports prescription eyewear. And don't forget, at checkout, make sure you put in the code DELI10 for your special, the Sports Deli Podcast, 10% discount. You can always send us an email to thesportsdeli at gmail.com or DM us on Instagram at Mike Hootner or on Twitter at Michael Hootner. And we're so glad that you're joining us here today. And let's see who's up first here. Wexler, are you there? Yes. Oh, he has arrived. John, are you doing uh, part of your dissertation right now while you're waiting? Yes. <laughs> Wait, go back. Is that the new gopher hole behind you? <laughs> yeah, Percy setting it on fire as we speak. <laughs> How is your practices going there, Mike, Coach that's not, that's not government approved attire. The money, the stimulus money is not supposed to be going for hats. <laughs> it's a write-off. Fucking A. My fucking money. <laughs> <these> motherfuckers. <laughs> Since you're in the garage, yeah, if, you, exactly. if, if you go to Chevron and get a five-gallon, a five-gallon container of gas, is that deductible as an office expense? <clears throat> Not for your primary job. If it's your secondary job, then yes. What if you bought cat litter because there was an oil? <laughs> That's disgusting. <laughs> because there was an oil spill in the garage that Absolutely. you needed to clean up. Could that be? Hey, you, you guys got to see the garage now, man. It is, it, is, it is a big upgrade going on. It's not a garage. Just that's the problem. <laughs> I'm like, your mom has to rent a garage from the neighbor to park her car. <laughs> I tripled my Wi-Fi speed. Thank you very much. Yeah. Can from you tell? One to three. No. Why don't you have St. So John's up, John? You should have St. John's up first, then Duke. I'm not putting Duke up. I'm going to hey, actually Hey, ask. hey. What? You got something against winners? So Duke's got to find a guy who's never been fired. Yes. Wow. That eliminates like three quarters of all coaches. It's the best job in the country. I'd go if I were them. I'd go. Get, I'll go get Mike Ray. I know he's going to retire. Oh, by the way, Chris Beard wants six million dollars for the IU job. Yeah, he wants double what he's making. And you know who? You want to take a guess who paid the buyout for Archie Miller? Um, in in full, ten million check. Uh, the the cook, the guy cook, the who lives in Bloomington, who runs the. Uh, as the Mark Cuban. No, Mark he didn't. Cuban. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. That's a rumor. You got. You can't substantiate that. You can't substantiate that. I can't substantiate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, enough. Let's bring our guest on already. Enough of this nonsense. He probably can't hear us yet. Uh oh. He, he can hear us. The, the three he's, dots he's went done. off. He turned off his video. That's a bad sign. It's not <laughs> a, awful. Not a good he's start. He's had enough. <laughs> Rashad, you're supposed to save me, man, from these clowns. Gordon, are you guys are you guys playing games? What's the situation? We will be playing games in in the, the second week of April. Coach, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, well, God, please save me from these two. That's clowns. bad news for you. Oh. <laughs> uh, all they're doing, all they're doing, is talking shit, Rashawn, about all kinds of stuff and meanwhile john's in a fake phd program and gordon's having fake practices right now in, in <laughs> seattle so step and, and mike stole and mike stole a hat from a 10 year old so that's it works out <laughs> mike was trying to explain how just because i sat next to you for 35 seconds in cameron during the k academy how you won't remember me and i i i acknowledge oh, that he doesn't remember you gordon he we sat next to each other in cameron how could he forget well we've been in contact a few times since then a couple times and we, we have a mutual acquaintance yeah we know <laughs> will right <laughs> big will yeah will's my guy man will's a good guy yeah i mean guy. i mean i've known will since i was like 14 man he's wow. a good dude 
You know, I was at I was at Morgan Wooten's camp, Mason Dixon at Mount St. Mary's to mm -hmm. work. And I, I, I was waiting for my roommate to show up the first day, right? You just, you drive up to campus and you unpack your stuff and you lie down for a few minutes because, you know, once camp starts, it's going to be nonstop. And uh, sure. the guy who was supposed to be my roommate must have found out I was his roommate and decided to sleep somewhere else. <laughs> and, 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 and so they signed me a new roommate and that new roommate was Will. Wow, that, that must not have been a whole lot of conversations going on. <laughs> and he rolled in there and we were talking about we were talking about Indiana basketball before he even put his bag down. And, and, and I, I got really lucky that day because I, I, I've got a lifetime friend out of yeah, that. You know, uh, when it comes to when it comes to basketball, man, that dude's a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> yep. I mean, he is he is something else and, and he's passionate. So that's always a good thing. So are you. I try to be, man. I, I try to share what I've learned from the guys that I got it from, you know, and pass it on to the next group of, uh, you know, hoopers and, you know, now coaches, too. I try to help as many young coaches as I can to, uh, you know, how to approach practice, how to approach games, how you know, just so that they can be prepared and all that stuff, man. So I just try to share the knowledge that I've gained over the years. Be on your best behavior, John. Disappointing. <laughs> All right, let's rock and roll. We're joined today by former Dukey Rashawn McLeod, who hails to us from Jersey City, New Jersey, who will share his incredible story with us today of evolution and courage. He will lead us through his journey of trials and tribulations that led him from the highs of the athletic world, playing basketball for arguably the greatest high school, college, and professional basketball coach in the history of the game to not wanting to live after his mother died and he was separated from his youngest kids as a young parent. He credits his wife and brother in large part for saving him and in turn his son who also has depression and helping him understand who he really is which is something he thought he knew but never really knew until after his NBA career was over. He shares a birthday with Danny DeVito, Martin Scorsese, Lorne Michaels, and Syracuse head coach Jim Beheim. Man, you were doing so good till that last bit. I also share a birthday with my son, uh, my youngest son. Wow. Now, so. cool. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. That's so cool. Well, that'll, that'll yeah. negate the birthday that you share with Coach Beheim. <laughs> he played for the legendary <laughs> high school coach, Bobby Hurley Sr. at St. Anthony's, which unfortunately closed its doors in 2017. He was the first transfer that Coach K at Duke ever accepted into his program after he left St. John's. He was the 20th overall pick, as you can see, wearing his Hawks uh, polo shirt tonight proudly, in the 1998 draft by the Atlanta Hawks, where he played until 2001 before finishing his career with the Boston Celtics due to a lingering injury. It was a nerve injury that I did in the summer league, yeah, going into. Oh, wow. That's right going into the season. So I didn't get a chance to play my, my last year. Well, it changed the course of my career. I mean, I played, I played a half a season with the Hawks on it that made it worse. And then uh, once I realized, once I found out what the injury was, I, I think I might've played four games with three games in Philadelphia and didn't get a chance to play at all in Boston. Just, uh, and then once I, they told me I wasn't going to be able to play a doctor wouldn't clear me to play because of the injury. Uh, so it, it changed my career. It ended my career, basically. And then I ended up rupturing mm. my Achilles tendon <laughs> as a wow. result of it. So uh, it, it it changed. And when it changes your life like that, you remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah. He's a current mentor, life coach, father, husband, brother, and friend, and loves to give back, especially to other parents, to teach them how to better connect with their kids. You can find him on Instagram at I am Big Ro, R O or at parentusa.org. And thanks for coming and getting that karma and a big warm welcome to the sports deli. Do, do you like social media? Like, are you doing this TikTok stuff and posting on Instagram all the time? <laughs> stuff like that. I'm not, I'm not a big social media guy, but you know, my daughter's teaching me how to use a little bit more and more. So, <laughs> well, you I should miss, definitely I miss yeah. the payphone, man. <laughs> yeah, right. Absolutely. <laughs> well, you should definitely uh, promote yourself a little bit more because uh, your story is incredible. 
Um, I heard I've been doing name. more speaking. I've been doing more speaking. Yeah. I just did a, I did, I just did a, 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 a something with the Duke Fuqua Business School. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I heard it. It was it was amazing. You, you did a phenomenal job. It went really, really well. Uh, I was really yeah. excited. I think a lot of the people who were on got a lot out of it, and I got a lot out of it as well. Oh, cool. Uh, some of the things there's no way to possibly know, you know, unless you hear someone speak, you know, uh, as candidly as you did. So I, I appreciate what you what you shared with them. And hopefully we can delve into some of those things, um, you know, especially about some of the taboo things that you talked about uh, that especially in the black and brown community um, still to this day are not not things that are talked about or, you know, encouraged for that matter. So uh, but we'll get back to that. But but but. You know, as Gordon said, you know, you know, uh, you were in, in New Jersey and you started with a Hall of Fame coach, you know, the middle of your career was with a Hall of Fame coach and then you finished with another one. And um, so what um, about because you started basketball late, right? Yeah, my freshman year of high school. Yeah. So that's crazy. And and then you just as a 10 and I didn't play as a 10th grader. I, I quit. Right. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't really into it. I did it because my friends did it. I, I was a baseball player. I was a catcher. And then I grew about, I, I grew, I went from like five, seven to like six feet. And so being a catcher just wasn't <laughs> in my yeah. cards because yeah. I went from being a short chubby guy to a long lanky guy. So then I tried to pitch I was a terrible pitcher. <laughs> uh, you know, first base was kind of my thing, but didn't really enjoy it. All my friends left baseball, went to basketball. So I just followed man and, didn't enjoy it. So I quit as a 10th grader. Uh, but by the end of my freshman year, I was six, five. <laughs> wow. So, so Jordan and, uh, gets cut, Jordan gets cut as a sophomore and you quit and you were, you know, you weren't doing the, 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 the best things, right. You were making bad choices. Yeah. What a funny, I wasn't necessarily making bad choices. I was just procrastinating, you know, like I wanted to hang out with my friends who were making bad choices but I was afraid of my mom and, and at the same time. So <laughs> even though I had quit basketball, I was still down the park, like working on my game. I just was afraid of Mr. Hurley. So I got tired of being yelled at. And so I would tell my mother I was going to practice and I would tell coach Hurley I had to go to church. So, uh, you know, so I just try to, I try to work on my game with the stuff that he was showing me, but you know, I just, I just was afraid of him as a, you know, as a coach because of all the yelling and screaming and uh, it was just intimidating as a, because, and on top of that, I was a 14 year old sophomore. Like I, I my birthday's in November. So I was a 13 year old freshman and then I turned 14. So as a 14 year old sophomore turning 15. So I graduated at 17 years old from high school turning, well, 18. Uh, and I, I was 17 for the first three months of college basketball. <laughs> Rashawn, does that does that affect how you work with young people? Uh, it does because uh, I was fortunate enough to be, um, you know, even though I was younger than everybody, I spent more time with a lot of the guys who were two, you know, a year and a half, two years older than me. So my my maturity was a little bit higher than most, and I was the oldest brother in a single parent family, so I had to grow up a little faster than most kids. But nowadays, when I see a kid who's a little bit younger, um, I try to get them to make sure that they use that time wisely and, and, you know, not necessarily try to get more than what they, what they're ready for. That's always uh, a key for me. Um, you know, when I look at the game, I look at it, what am I ready for right now? Like if you're the same player in high school, which is what they want you to be nowadays, they want you to be this superstar in high school. And then what else is there to become when you become a college player and a pro player? Uh, there has to be a, a, a development phase of I shoot. The, I, I don't I, I didn't shoot one three point shot in high school. Like a lot of people don't know that I didn't I didn't even attempt one. And, you know, by the time I became a, a junior in college, I added it to my arsenal. Um, it, it helped me become a better player. Uh, it gave me more offensive weapons. Uh, it, it just expanded my game and it changed. So every year my goal was to add something new to my game. So. When I teach young guys, I'm always trying to teach them how to take it step by step. Don't try to get ahead of yourself. Wasn't the For three sure. point wasn't the three point line at White Eagle out of bounds? <laughs> <laughs> nice, great, greatest gym to ever play in. The wars that you have in there. If you were a player in Jersey City or anywhere close, that was the place to be, man. Yeah, I was there one time with Will. Yeah, so, you, uh, sure. I mean, 
Go ahead. I, mean, I was just going to ask in regards to parents talking to you about this. You know, Michael McGladwell talks about this in a book when he actually looks at hockey in Canada and the strongest mm -hmm. junior players are actually where the parents kept them back a year. They're mm -hmm. right on the edge of the, of the birth date and their parents had the choice and they kept them back a year. So they're the oldest in their group and then they're in grade. Do you, do you think for the ones that are serious about it, that that's something parents should think about in regards to maturing for what, after what you went through? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, nowadays kids are, you know, they're, they have a wealth of information more than what we had as a youngster, but I don't think they're maturing emotionally faster. Um, I and I think, I think it's more dangerous today to <clears throat> allow a kid who's uh, emotionally immature to, to access the information, which is on Google and on their phone. But at the same time, uh, when it's put in play with uh, their, their peers, it makes it a little bit harder to say no. It makes it a little bit harder for them to stay on course. Uh, and as we know, you know, friends raise raise your kids, not parents. Um, <laughs> you know, their friends raise them, and 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 so you got to be careful. I, I would always suggest that, uh, like my son, depending on his emotional, uh, he'll he'll go through the same thing that I'm going through, but uh, that I went through. Uh, so I'm gonna gauge that. But my son is also. Uh, a Montessori kid so and it's funny because I see that signs of that now where uh when he you know when it comes to information he's smarter than most kids but he's still playing with Legos and those kids are watching shows that are a little bit different that he's like oh that's not interesting yet so I see that in my younger son now as well so I would encourage parents to take a look at that uh, because it, it'll it'll give their, their kids enough time to develop emotionally so that they can handle any success or failures that they may have or run into. Since, since we're talking about sort of the developmental piece and and maybe mentorship and coaching, it, it's <clears throat> it's fairly common for a player to uh, emulate the coach that he played for. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 it, and some guys always do that and that becomes their persona be it be it real or imagined and other guys find themselves did did you wrestle with that at all did you feel like you were coach k or part of coach k or coach hurley and did you have to parse that out as an instructor as a teacher uh i, I well i was fortunate man so not only coach k and coach coach hurley you know playing for lenny wilkins and larry brown as well um all very three different personalities mm. all four all four different personalities <clears throat> So what I tried to do was take the best of what I remember from each one and create my own version of it. Um, you know, the approach to how Lenny Wilkins approached, sen you know, seniority guys. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, uh, going through something with Coach K where he, he, he had more uh, comfort when a player was young and he was a superstar not holding them back. Um, Coach Hurley, the discipline of, you know, being on time and, you know, all the coaches had that. But I know when you're a young kid, that's even harder to grasp that you need to be, you know, be on time. Even if you're the best player, you're still down by the same rules as the rest of the team. Because uh, a lot of a lot of guys, that's their downfall and their careers, just thinking they can they're above the law. Uh, and then, you know, with Larry Brown, just technic his technical skills. I mean, he, you know, he wasn't very people oriented but when it came to and at his out of bounds unders and 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 time and score and things like that he was genius when it came to those things so I just try to take a little bit from each coach and 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 create the version of Rashawn McLeod that I wanted to see that could evolve with the players as they evolved can you talk a little bit about how the fraternity of players is there post-graduation do you stay in touch with guys do guys help each other out what, what what's what's the role like the cool thing about the the duke brotherhood is it doesn't matter who you play with uh we all connected so i i, I talked to grant i talked to jaminski i talked to jay billis i talked to bricky i talked to dave henderson you know johnny dawkins you know all of those guys who are a lot older than me but i still they you know they'll call and check up on me and see how i'm doing grant uh, Bobby, obviously, um, you know, it's not, it's not just a, a who you play with uh, atmosphere. It's, you know, it's a us, you know, we are, we are a community of, of Duke basketball. So uh, 
you know, depending on what it is that you're looking to do. I mean, we have a wealth of guys in different scenarios. You know, my roommate Trajan Langdon is the is the uh, you know GM for the Pelicans. One of my other teammates, Elton Brand, is the GM for the Sixers. You know, like some of our managers, I still keep in contact with. You know, so it's not just a players network. It's the, the you know a Duke brotherhood in the sense of you know, a part of the family as a whole. So a lot of our managers are in assistant general manager roles and administrative roles within the league and, and different uh, fields uh, of business. So, you know, it, it's the doors are open depending on what it is you want to do um, and, and making sure you talk to the right people. And Coach K is at the center of all that. You're listening to an interview with Rashawn McLeod, who played for four Hall of Fame coaches during his basketball career, first with Bobby Hurley Sr. at St. Anthony's in New Jersey in high school, then with Coach K in college at Duke. He then played for Lenny Wilkins in Atlanta in the NBA, and then finally played for Larry Brown in Philadelphia before finishing his career, as you heard earlier, with the Celtics. So please grab your favorite deli sandwich or bagel and your favorite beverage, as we will now hear Rashawn's, Dr. J's, and Coach K's opinions about the current vacancy in Bloomington at Indiana University with the men's basketball position right here in the Sports Deli. Do you, you think that uh, with, with the Indiana job being open now and there's all kinds of talk whenever a job like that is open, do you think that um, uh, some coaches spend more energy in developing their coaches tree, for lack of a better word? I know the thing, you know, as an IU grad, I'm always talking about Coach Knight, obviously, and you know, Coach Knight's coaching tree is relatively non-existent, whereas Coach K's coaching tree has a lot of branches. Do you think that's yeah. a conscious decision on the part of the coach? Um, I think and, and to some guys, I think coach has just been organic about a lot of the things. I mean, his his approach to a lot of this is about helping you become the best version of yourself. So uh, it's been a little bit more organic. I don't think it's one of those things that he sits down and he thinks about, well, how many guys can I get in positions? I think it's just, hey, what what is it that you want to do? And let's, let's figure out a plan and let's, let's work towards those goals. So um, you know, Indiana, I mean, I spent two years there with, unfortunately, with Tom Cream, but <laughs> <laughs> right. you said it, I didn't, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but, you know, Bloomington is a wonderful place for basketball that the fans are unbelievable. Um, I, I could see a, a guy like uh, Steve Wojciechowski, uh, you know, although, you know, Marquette is, is, is a great community of for basketball because it doesn't compete with anything else similar to Indiana. Uh, but I, I could see guys, you know, Johnny Dawkins or somebody, you know, moving up and taking a, 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 a stab at going to Indiana. I think the biggest thing about it is, um, in, you know, Indiana has always been such a, a great place to play because it, it recruited at home. And I think, we, you know, whoever gets the job is going to have to have deep roots in the, in the state of Indiana and surrounding uh, to make sure that they can get that, keep the talent there. But at the same time, bring maybe bring one or two pieces from other places to to complement what's what's being because basketball is so big now. I mean, you know, guys are leaving certain areas and going to live somewhere else. Oh, they spent most of their life somewhere else. So it's, mm-hmm. it's just. So, Rashawn, Gordon and I talk about this. I think the Indiana program is to college basketball right now what the Nebraska program is to college football. I, I, could, I, I, could, I think they're in, I think they're in absolute 100 percent denial and living in the past. And what you were you were there for two years. What is it going to take? you know, holistically, the whole package, because. Did you, you just, just use the word holistic? He did. <laughs> Jesus yeah. Christ. I can't even believe that word came out of your mouth. But I mean, you, but what is it going to take? I don't, wow. I think it's a, I think it's one of those programs that can be a dead end job. You know, if, if not got, if you don't get the right person, because. So, so yeah, before Rashawn, a- before Rashawn answers, <laughs> let, let me ask you this. Do you feel the same way about UCLA? <laughs> Me? Yeah. It was. They got, it was. They, they got the wrong guy at UCLA right now. They should have well, got Well, they've 15. had 10 wrong guys if you're going to go by that, right? <laughs> they got the wrong guy at UCLA right now? Nick Cronin? They're not going to win with Nick Cronin. 
They are Nick winning with Cronin. First of all, it's Mick, but but that's that's Ooh, neither here nor there. Whatever. But 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 see that see wait wait here's the problem here's the problem. Hootner just said they're winning. They're the 11th seed. They're UC freaking LA. That's not winning. The 11th seed in the NCAA don't count this year. They did a great job last year, and this year you can't you can't you missed you 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 missed you you you've diluted my point. Okay. My, my point was not, that, you know, did they win this year? Here's my point. My point is when you have Coach K or Bob Knight or Adolph Rupp or John Wooden and those guys are done, the, the program sustains some scars from the departure. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I, I think, disagree uh, with that. So, I think, yeah. Go ahead, Rashawn. Now you can. Question. So to answer the question <laughs> about uh, Indiana, man, I, I just – I think it's going to take an, an Indiana guy to do it. You know, uh, that's just my take on it because he's the most connected to the program, what it stands for. Um, and, and I think that's what it, he, when I was there, they did a lot of, we won these championships, you know, before 76. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, exactly. It, it was a, it, it was a bunch of that, but I think you, you, you do have to, you know, put out front your accomplishments, but at the same time, you got to do things that's going to, you know, parallel and rival what you've done with what you're doing now. Um, and, and I think that's the, the, the bridge that needs to be uh, crossed. Uh, you you got to win now too. So right. are you, how, how's your recruiting? What are your recruiting efforts? Um, you know, uh, and Indiana is a, a fickle place because they, you know, if, if there's an Indiana kid and you're not recruiting them, they'll get on you. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, they really want to keep the kids that are the best kids in Indiana at Indiana. But the way that basketball is played today, those kids may not complement one another. <laughs> That's the difference between, you know, back then and now. And I think the fans have to grow. Not, not just the, the, the atmosphere of the program. The how, fans have to grow. How is the Indiana facility? I mean, I've never been in it. I mean, it was awful. In. But when I was exactly. there, exactly, that's, that's what I thought. But they it, looked awful. Awful. <laughs> it looked awful on TV. No, I'm like, Rashawn, Rashawn, so don't. They, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm talking horrible. about, I'm it's talking horrible. about like the practice and stuff like that. Like a lot of programs have practice facilities now. Indiana yeah. has a practice facility, you know, that's that's state of the art to an extent, but it's still not, you know, the the, the building at Duke. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. It's yeah. not. You know, Texas is not certain, you know, Texas is a football school, but their basketball, you know, facilities are unbelievable because of the finances that they have. But the, right. the funny part is, is Indiana has has finances. I mean, they're, you know, Cook is is is, is a big heavy hitter in that in that area. John. Um, <laughs> so is Mark Cuban. I hear Mark Cuban. Yeah, he Mark, he, he uh, didn't he cut the check. It wasn't Mark, Mark Cuban. Cuban. Mark Cuban wrote the check. <laughs> Got Archie Miller out of there. Oh, go ahead, Rashawn. Ar he, couldn't, couldn't, Ar he couldn't get the he, Mark Cuban couldn't throw the black card on the table quick enough. To get Archie Miller out of there. Hey, but but you know, so I, I just I just think that um you know there's got to be somebody who is who who's played there um you know kind of what Michigan did with Juwan Howard. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that was probably you know, and everybody thought that was going to be a failure. But, you know, Jawan and his passion and his understanding of what he his vision of what he wanted Michigan to be and what they've created at Michigan. He's bringing that he's bringing that back. And he may he's not just living in the past. He's actually doing something. And, and you know what the best the best hire Jawan uh, Jawan Howard made Phil Martelli as his assistant. Yeah, because of I mean, I mean, he's a, he's a legend. Right. <laughs> I mean, he recruited me in high school. So that right. was you know, how long ago he he's right. been doing this. And who's in, you know, I still talk when I see him at camps and clinics and things like that. I mean, he remembers everything about me as a kid and, and he's getting to learn me as a, as an adult and a coach now. And I try to pick his brain every time I see him um, at AAU events when I'm, you know, when I'm coaching, you know, I'll see him and we'll, we'll, we'll like chop it up. But, you know, you have to, you have to be able to have a, a, a coach that, especially when you don't have a whole lot of experience, you have to have a coach to be able to guide you through those tough moments so you don't you know crash and burn right. Right. let me let me ask you a question gordon is that okay yeah i just was gonna say i don't think <laughs> michael ahead. lewis is gonna be a good coach at indiana <laughs> 
Steve, exactly. what's Steve they need to doing? go after Brad. They need to go after Brad Stevens, man. Yeah, that's I what I said. I, I texted Gordon It'll back the happen. Brinks truck up to Brad Stevens' I was, house and I was just, a day. Listen, I was just on a Butler just call. call a I was just on a Butler call yesterday with a guy who wrote a book, and there's Brad Stevens has unequivocally said he's not going back to Indiana. So if they can find a way to hire him and he doesn't have to go to the state, there's a chance. <laughs> Coach on Zoom. <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, Steve, I think there, Steve Falkner I think there, would be cheap right about now. Yeah, he would, but I, I think I think one of the Drew boys are probably a more likely Indiana connection for, yeah, for right now right. than than Steve Alford. And I, but that that's just me. Who knows? Yeah. Anything could happen. Go ahead, Mike. If you talked about Juwan Howard, and I wasn't going to ask this question, but John reminded me about his own question that he's asked in the past about the culture of campuses, especially after the pandemic. And, uh, you know, Jawan obviously has clout. Uh, he has the ability to sell the NBA. You know, he played on the Fab Five. Um, but do you think most coaches have to uh, pivot and recruit differently now? Um, so the recruits see that there's more to the campus than just basketball because of what, what happened with the racial reckoning this past summer? Oh, for sure, man. I mean, just being on, you know, I coached high school basketball in the last couple of years and just the recruiting aspect is different on both sides. Um, you know, uh, I think that um, with, when you're recruiting a kid now, especially, I mean, it's on Duke's campus. I mean, it's, it's happening that on every campus, uh, especially with the pandemic and everything that's going on. Um, now, I, if I had the answer to that, man, I, I'd sell it. But <laughs> but at the same time, I, I just think it's about finding a kid who's uh, tough, um, you know, that's not going to quit on you because because of things that are out of your control. Who, you know, that, you know, they say, I want to have this person in the foxhole with me. You got to find kids that are willing to, to go through the tough times and and uh, and still play through. them. I mean, but because nowadays kids are not as mentally tough and you know they want things done a certain way or they, they just run they just go away like we've grown up we fought through things I mean it was I played at St. Anthony's High School for four you know for about well, three years if I would have came home and said "Ma, I want to transfer because coach is yelling at me my mother would have punched me <laughs> but nowadays you know you got a you know you got a parent who's you know who kid is probably average at best thinking that their son should be starting on varsity. And if they don't, they go to three different schools. So, you know, if, that, if you're doing it in high school, what are the odds of you doing that in college when you're challenged for the first time? And, and he, here's the crazy thing. I was talking about this with a friend of ours, with the guys know with a, who's coaching college ball right now. And I was talking to him last night. And I remember, and you know this, the seniors that are out there can return next year. Right. So, you know, what is that so for, why for all these kids are going – Right, and you got incoming freshmen that are scholarships have already been granted to. All these kids are going into the transfer portal. There's not a guarantee. There's going to be a bunch of kids who are going to end up at D three if they're not careful, or D two because they miscalculated their market, and they can't go yeah. back to where they left because someone took their spot. And then they're going to be sitting there, a guy like I'm making his place up, like you know Creighton, Indiana, Iowa State, Indiana State, who's going to end up at like Augusta State if he's not careful. Because he's being advised, <laughs> oh, you can get in there. And it's crazy because I'm reading all these guys. And look, coaches change. I get it. But when like seven guys are going into the transfer portal from one program, the math doesn't add up. The math doesn't add up. You're looking at it like, well, there's not seven yeah, spots. I mean, it's happening, it's happening with Pitt right now. Jeff. Right. That's what I'm going to That's the example we were talking about last night. And I'm like, whatever you think of Capel, and I'm not getting into it, but the, the numbers don't add up. If you're a kid at Pitt, where do you think you're going? Right. I mean, because it's not like you were at the top of the league. Exactly. You're at pit. So. I mean, literally, you're at the pit. And so you're like, and you're like, okay. I mean, it's the old saying, we're losing with you. So if you're right. going somewhere, a winning program, why would they want to take – they'd rather take a chance on a freshman. No, and Augusta was 9-7, and seven, John. <laughs> oh. <laughs> nice. Well, real quick, Rashawn, we – so a quick story. Real quick. Oh, boy. Here we this go. Be quick. No Jesus quick Christ. stories. No. This is a good Mike. one. This is a good one. <laughs> this is a good one. So when we were at Goucher, uh, Roderick Rhodes' team with your coach was practicing there at our gym. And we and mm -hmm. Coach Early let us watch. And it was very, you know, we, right? so Roderick Rhodes and the team go down and take a shower. And they're taking forever. And Coach Hurley tells him, Gordon was there. 
Coach Hurley goes, I hate this team. I hate this team. <laughs> They're lazy. What year, what year was this? What year was With this? With Roderick Rhodes' senior year. So what is that? Oh, yeah, 92. That was my junior year, 92. Okay, so you were downstairs. I forgot that. So he said, maybe this is true. You could confirm it. He goes, let me tell you about this team. I, I got a call from the bus driver that the team was acting up on the bus. So after practice the other day, we drove around Jersey City for three hours, getting off and getting on the bus, because apparently I needed to teach my team how to practice getting on and getting off the bus. He goes, that's my fault. He said, that's my fault. I wasn't aware that we had to practice getting on and getting off the bus. And then Roger yes, Rhodes comes up and he says to Roger, he goes, and I was there, so I can tell you this. He goes, he says to Roger, he's like, Don't you know the watch? You got to go back to the hotel. I think you're playing in the Charm City Classic probably or something like that, high school. That's exactly and right. Roger, and, and Roger goes, well, coach, you got to see, you know, like, it, it takes a while for the showers to heat up. And I go, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I must look like a guy who gives a fuck. <laughs> we were dying. First of all, first of all, the, the story the story is about accurate, except it, it wasn't St. Anthony's. It was Bill Ellerby's team, Simon Gratz from Philadelphia. No, no, no. no. It wasn't Roderick Rhodes. It was it was, it was Rasheed no. Wallace. But other no, than that, no, 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 it's no. a perfect story. No, that story is exactly right. They, we played Dunbar. Right. That's right. Uh, I actually watched the game. The game's actually on YouTube now. Uh, somebody put it up. Wow. Uh, we played Dunbar, and we were trying to get a game with Simon Gratz because they were number one team in the country. Right. And we, right. you know, we were number we were number two, and uh, and uh, I was like, uh, no, no, Dunbar was number one. Right. We were number two, and Simon Gratz was number four. That's what it was. And we they had us a uh, matched against Lake Clifton, but we felt as though if we could beat Simon Gratz. And then beat, you know, and beat Dunbar, which we lost by one. Right. Uh, we would have been unanimously the number one team in the country. So the, I, I remember that <laughs> like it was yesterday. <laughs> now, was but it? We, did didn't we Lincoln also play in that, Rashawn? Uh, yeah, Lincoln. But played it's in Steph it. Marbury, right? Yeah, they played in it. Lake that Clinton, was a hell of a Dun, tournament. Dunbar from Dunbar from uh, I think it was Dunbar. They played Dunbar from D.C. Uh, at the time. Uh, so I mean it, it 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 was it was a great tournament. I mean it was absolutely unbelievable. One of the you know, we actually went my senior year again. It was so good. And you know, we won it yeah. and beat Dunbar in the championship of that of that classic that that year as well. But not only did we practice getting on and off the bus, we practiced coming in and out of the game too. <laughs> yeah. But the funny thing is we did that at Duke too. <laughs> oh wow. That's classic. We, we was, practice coming in off the bench and shaking your teammates' hands. I mean, we, wow. you know, if you, if you didn't get it, you didn't play, man. So was was Carlos Cueto on your uh, squad? He was. Carlos was a sophomore that year. Uh, he actually got a lot of time that game. Yeah, uh, well, I, yeah, I, I, I tried to recruit him. Yeah, Carlos was Carlos was uh, he was a stud, man. Coming up, I yeah. mean, eighth grade. He, I mean, he was the same size as a senior in high school as he was in eighth grade. So, yeah, did he wind uh, up at? He, I think he wound up at Richmond. Did Richmond, he wind up at Richmond? Yeah. yeah. So Richmond. we had no shot, right? We, I mean, we we're we're a three. Yeah. But it was, as you can see, Gordon was a really good talent evaluator. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I will say that nobody at Goucher College ever brought in anybody from Dematha other than me, and I'll leave it right there. <laughs> Hey, listen. Hey, what is he, Marcus he, Washington doing now? He's not going to be on the sports deli anytime soon. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> God bless America. Oh, man. I really don't know where to go from here because I had this all scripted out and you guys have all moved everything sideways. Well, I'll jump in. Wait, let me ask another. We're on, to, we're on coaching, so we'll just leave it here. Coach K leaves in a year or two. Is there a chance? I know you got friends. So I'm not expecting you to say who would get. Is I'm going to play it the other way. Is Jesus there a Christ. chance they would go outside the Duke family for the head job? Uh, no. I mean, no. The, the furthest outside the Duke family, I think they go is Mike Bray. But why exactly. would you mm. the game Good one. To, to, to go to Duke? I mean, it's – I mean, he's in the same – he would be taking a sidestep, but it'd be harder playing, coming in right. playing behind Coach – you know, coaching behind Coach K. So – I mean, I think Mike Bray should retire where he's at. I mean, he can just sit back and he's got, he recruits the right type of kid. He wins the right amount of games. He does what he needs to do. 
uh, he's, you know, he stays, stays in that top 25 ish area. Most of the, most of the year after year. Hey, they've got a nice so, campus there. He's in Indiana. I mean, it's, it's, right. it's a good situation. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and moving stinks. So, yeah. so, you know, who wants to move and take a sidestep uh, for, you know, for the prestige of the job? Right. You know what I mean? It's and you know what they step. say, you, you you don't want to follow a Hall of Famer. You want to yeah. follow a guy who follows a Hall of Famer. It's the Hall of Famer, right. So, right. Uh, I mean, me personally, I could see Johnny Dawkins, you know, um, he has the he has the persona and I think uh, the, the, the pedigree to be able to, you know, take over that job, how successful he'll be. You know, we would have to wait and see, but I think he he's probably as deeply embedded into the, the culture as any any other any player out there. Yeah, I, I could also see Bobby Hurley uh, getting that job as well, but I could also see John Shire getting that job. And a mm-hmm. lot of people, I don't know if people even you know him realize having a coach, yeah. but I think John Shire's personality, uh, I think it fits. You know, the way that he, you know led his team his senior year moving from shooting guard to, to point guard and people not believing in him. I think that's his pedigree, you know, where he could step in and, and, and be a first time coach and, and they take a chance on him. Cause if it doesn't work, you know, he followed coach K if it works, right. they found the right guy. So you're right. right either way. Uh, it's kind of like one of the, it's kind of like a shack argument. <laughs> right. I mean, let me ask you a quick question. Cause uh, Gordon and I had this uh, disagreement few weeks back uh i said that coach k seems out of sorts this year uh he seems more agitated uh uncomfortable to put it mildly like a lot of coaches in the country but he just seemed a little bit just off with everything he snapped at a reporter gordon didn't think it was snapping but um did, did is that something that you noticed that he just didn't seem like himself this year um i just think more of uh, he he wore more of his personality on his sleeves. I mean, Coach K is Bobby Knight to a degree, you know, with yeah. with filter. And so, yeah. you know, <laughs> I, I just think that you know he would he the filter came off a little bit more because of the pandemic, because of yeah. you know, and sometimes people ask dumb questions. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and it, and it could be aggravating. Uh, more so on this in- show than anywhere else, <laughs> <laughs> John. <laughs> but uh but I, I just think that you know because of the state that we're in uh as a country uh where we are you know and, and he's tackling a lot of these issues you know from voting to you know black lives matter to you know the pandemic i mean it, it could take a toll on you at 70 you know 77 whatever i mean he's on he's not young you know so yeah uh he's he's not he's, he's not you can't he's not going to be learning new tricks. You know, you can't teach every old dog new tricks. Coach is kind of who he is. And I think it was just a little bit unfiltered because of all the stuff that's going on. We hope you enjoyed part one of this two-part series with Rashawn McLeod right here in the Sports Deli. Remember, your voice matters when fighting systemic racism. Read a book, acknowledge your white privilege, watch a movie about institutional racism, Call your local or state representatives and or have a conversation with somebody that doesn't look like you so that we can change the economic, educational, police, housing, and prison narratives that currently need to be changed in this country. In this country. Remember, the Sports Daily is sponsored by Sport RX. You can contact them at 888-831-5817. They are the leader in sports prescription eyewear. If you order anything online, don't forget to enter the code DELI10 at checkout for your special The Sports Deli Podcast 10% discount. We hope that you listen to part two of this incredible podcast with Rashawn McLeod. And among other things, we will talk about the Black Lives Matter movement and the racial reckoning. And you don't want to miss the very famous rapid fire this or that segment of the podcast. For Dr. J and Coach K, I am Hootie Hoot. Thanks again for joining us in the Sports Deli. Remember, you can always send us an email to thesportsdeli at gmail.com or DM us on Instagram at Mike Hootner or on Twitter at Michael Hootner. Until next time, please mask up. Remember, Black Lives Matter. Peace.